So function composition is where you feed a function another function. So instead of just giving it an x or an x value, a number, we have fed functions some things that were not just regular inputs. So this is an example of function composition where we fed f the expression x plus h. So another way to look at this, I could let g of x equal x plus h, and then I could rewrite f of x plus h as f of g of x. So I just took the input and renamed it g of x. So we've seen one example of function composition already. And we're like going to look a lot more deeply at function composition now. So when you think about a function as uh, an input-output mechanism, and you can draw the domain and range, and your function f is the way to go from the domain to the range, So that's another way to think about a function. And we look at function composition. That means the input of a function is another function. So if we look at <clears throat> this f of g of x, who eats x first in this expression right here, f of g of x? G of x. So it's a little strange, g of x eats first. Basically, whoever's closer to the x eats first. So what does that mean when you see f next to g? It means the one on the right goes first, even though we read left to right. So it's a little bit strange because the one on the right actually goes first before the one on the left. A better way to think about it is you apply the inside function and then the outside function, kind of working inside out. So that's a better way to think about it. So if g eats first, uh, and if we look at this way to go from the domain to the range, so let's rewrite that with f of g of x. So this means g eats first, so we're going to go from the domain of g, apply the g function, we'll get to the range of g, now we have a slight problem because f is supposed to eat next, however, if I just draw f like this, that'll be the range of f. What did I assume? I made an assumption in this diagram. Exactly right. So normally f eats from the domain of f. So if I have a perfect diagram like this, I would be assuming that the range of g is equal to the domain of f. And that very rarely happens, that everything matches up perfectly like this. So that generally won't happen. Generally, the range of g is not going to be exactly the same as the domain of f. So what really happens is more complicated we get what we call an intersection. So have I drawn Venn diagrams before in this class? Oh, yeah, one. Exactly. Only one of them? Perhaps like chapter two or something. So <clears throat> what we're going to use is a Venn diagram here for the uh, range of g in the domain of f. They may not completely overlap. 
So we have range of G and domain of F, and then their intersection is really what we're interested in. So G is going to eat first, F is going to eat second. Now because we have to make this restriction in the middle, what the implication is, is that maybe over here in the range, in the domain of G, that we're only allowed to use some of the domain of G. Which part of the domain of G, whatever lands inside this middle set right here, the intersection of these two. We don't want to input values that would, uh, that would land over here, for example. I don't want to input a value that would land outside the domain of F. And something also on the output occurs. So this is normally the range of F. And we're not going to get the full range, usually. What we'll get is some of the range, because we're not going to use the full domain of F. We are only going to get part of this, so we may only get some portion of the range of F. So we may not necessarily get the full range. So how does this work when we compute the actual? So you can see that the domain of G is going to be a little smaller uh, when we compose it than maybe the original. So maybe we have to throw out some extra uh, X values here. So how do we find this set right here? That's what we're going to look at now. So we'll call this the restricted domain of G. So we will write this out in set builder notation. So it'll be all x's in the domain of G, but there's going to be some restrictions. So normally this would just be the entire domain of G. You can just write all x's in the domain of G, but I want to put a restriction on them. So I'm going to put a condition here such that what property do I want g of x to have? So g of x needs to be inside of the domain of f. So I want to take all x's such that when I apply the g function, I need to know, is g of x going to be here, or is g of x going to be here? I have to know where they're going to land. So I want to know, when I apply the g function, am I going to land inside the domain of f? So this is one way to write out the restricted domain. So if we write this in English, we want all x's in the domain of f, or the domain of g, such that g of x, so I could write is in the domain of f, but that's almost exactly what I wrote above, such that g of x is a valid input for f of x. So this is tricky. We're going to look at some examples, and hopefully this will make a little more sense. So I have two functions, f and g. and We'll do the easy question first. Just tell me the domain of f and the domain of g. So these are questions we did way back in chapter 1 at some point. So just tell me what's the domain of f, what's the domain of g. There should be exactly one x value missing from each of those domains. It should be pretty clear which one it is. <coughs> 
So F cannot input negative 1, and G cannot input positive 1. So that's the difference between the two domains. So any questions on the individual domains before we look at their uh, composite domain? So we'll compose them, let's see, yeah, we'll compose them in this order. That's the way I did the, uh, that's the way I did this diagram right here. So I can write this out in set builder notation. I'm basically just copying the set up there. So I want x in the domain of g such that g of x is in domain of f. And now I'm going to fill in the domain of g and the domain of f and g of x. So I'm filling in domain of g the actual g of x function, I'm writing that down, domain of f, so I wrote down exactly the set we had before, just filling in f of x, or filling in g of x and the two different domains. So any questions on writing that out? So we can translate these into some slightly different ways of writing. So let's work on the left side first. So what does it mean to be in the interval negative infinity to 1 union 1 to infinity? There's another way to write that. I could write it as all x such that x is not equal to 1. So I just rewrote that first condition. So it's all x such that we don't use 1. So that takes care of the one value that's not in that original domain. And now I'll switch to the blue marker, and we'll work on the right side. What does it mean? What does it mean for 4 over x minus 1 to be inside the interval minus infinity minus 1 union minus 1 infinity? How could this expression not be in the interval? There's only one value not inside this interval. This is a very big union. How could we not be in there? There's a really big chance the value of this expression is inside the interval. How would we not be in the interval? So if that expression is negative 1, we're not in the interval. That's the only way that we're not going to be in that interval there. So as long as 4 over x minus 1 is not negative 1, you're, not, you're, you're going to be inside the interval. So that second part's a little bit more tricky. So I just wrote down what does it mean for, to be inside the interval. It means that you're not negative 1. So any questions on that? So when answering these questions, are we just doing the um, x is not equal to 1, then the and, or do we have to have the x, z, or whatever? Well, so this right here is the same yeah. as that. 
So I just rewrote it. Oh. You could write it either way. It doesn't really matter. Um, the second part is really what I'm more focused on. So are there any questions on that second non-equality? When writing them, would you separate them with the and? Yeah, because you need both the conditions to be true. So it cannot be 1. x should not equal 1. And whatever x value makes this negative 1 is also a bad x value. So those are the two x values that we can't use, basically. So let's figure out what x value makes this equal to negative so we're going to hunt for the bad x value. So what we're going to do is intentionally set it equal to negative 1 and then solve for x. So I want to know what x actually makes this negative 1. So do some algebra and tell me what x makes this negative 1. A good first move is recognizing fractions suck and multiplying by your denominator so you don't have fractions. So take 30 seconds, tell me what x value makes this negative 1. There should be exactly one solution. So negative 3 is the bad x value that would make this fraction negative 1. So are there any questions on getting that bad x value? This is the one we don't want to use. This is the one <coughs> that we need to exclude. All right, so don't use negative 3. So now we can use that and rewrite our set. And we'll keep it in the set builder notation. So what we just did is translated that inequality into just exclude negative 3. So this right here just means exclude negative 3. So we'll just rewrite it with that. So exclude 1 and exclude negative 3. And we're always going to answer in set no in interval notation. So writing this out in interval notation, very reasonable to use a number line, 1, negative 3. So I can line everything up and see the three intervals that are remaining. You can always write negative infinity and positive infinity. So these are the three intervals minus infinity to negative 3, union negative 3, 1, union 1 to infinity. So that is the answer to what is the domain. It's going to seem like more work at the beginning to pay attention to all this stuff. These questions can be some of the more tricky questions in this class because you do have to pay attention to what output of the first function is not a valid input for the second one. So you have to think about that Venn diagram. So we'll do some more examples. First, let's switch the order and see what happens. So I want to know what is the domain of f of g of x? And I'll write this out in regular set builder notation. So who eats first? Uh-oh. I think that's what we just did. Yeah. That won't be very exciting. <laughs> 
So we'll do g of f. So I'm putting them in the other order. So first off, I need to make sure the inside function can eat. So I have to make sure x is in the domain of the first function, such that the output f of x is in the domain of the second function, which is g. So what I just wrote down is the analog of this, except the only thing is f and g traded places. So it's the exact same thing, except wherever you see g, you're going to put f and vice versa. Uh, what did I write incorrect? What should be right here instead of just f of x? Domain. That should be domain f of x. All right, now we're going to fill in. So the domain of f, we wrote that down at the beginning. Don't use negative 1. Now, the function f of x. inside domain of G was negative infinity to one union one to infinity so this time around I won't rewrite the first part here I'll just leave it the way it is You always have to rewrite the second part. And I'll do that in a blue pen again. So, so what does it take to be inside this interval? Or more succinctly, what does it mean to not be inside this interval? So what's the x value that, or what is the value of this expression that would not land inside this interval? just one. So I want to know, I need to be sure this is not one. That's a single value that would be bad for the second function to eat. So take a minute and figure out what x needs to be for this to equal one. So find the bad x value. So find the x value, that will give you 1. So zero is the bad x value that would give us, would land outside the domain. So all we have to do, we already knew don't use negative one, now we know don't use zero. So we're going to write a number line, remove those two. So we got zero is bad, and negative one is bad.